For about the last 20 years of my career, I've had the opportunity to work on some of the most consequential projects and issues that face our region, our state, and even our nation. But really, over the last 10 years, I've had the distinct honor and privilege to work alongside our wildland firefighters, addressing issues of community safety and resilience, attack effectiveness, and firefighter health and safety. During that decade, I came across a startling realization. Now, it's not some new tool to improve attack effectiveness or help save lives. The realization I had was nothing at all. And what I mean by that is that I found out that over the years, as we started asking questions, as we started doing our research, there were so many things that haven't been addressed. Effectively, wildland firefighting is easily a generation behind that of high-rise structure and urban firefighting. Now, this is something that took me a long time to realize and really get a handle on, but let me tell you, the firefighters, they realize this from day one. So let me take you back in time a little bit and introduce you to Ed Pulaski. In 1911, he adopted a new tool for wildland firefighting. That tool today bears his name, the Pulaski. Now, 100 years ago, if you were to uh, look at wildland firefighting, it's a fairly rudimentary process at that time. But if you were to compare that to, say, uh, the military at about that same time, it's also a very different uh, environment than what we see today. In fact, if you were to take a soldier off the battlefield in the early 1900s and place them on the battlefield today, it would be nearly unrecognizable. There would be some similarities, right? But a lot has fundamentally changed. If you were to take a wildland firefighter from early 1900s and drop them on a wildland fire today, it would be, unfortunately, immediately recognizable. Now, some would say the industry has shifted, right? But the tools are the same. A lot of the tactics are the same. And yes, indeed, we do have new technology. We have aircraft. We have new things that have never been used before. And so some people would say, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But what I'm here to talk to you about is that it is broken. And so let's go back to the 1960s, 1970s, when our country was facing some really big issues. All right? You couldn't see across the street in Los Angeles. Rivers were literally catching on fire. The symbol of our nation, the bald eagle, was going extinct. We had places like Love Canal emerge as some of the most toxic, hazardous sites in the United States. But we also landed a person on the moon. And so at that time, we said, these aren't insurmountable problems. We can figure these things out. So at about the same time, the Nixon administration had started a program and a, and a commission to deal with urban firefighting because it was a big problem at the time. And so in 1973, they commissioned a report called America Burning. And that report helped to fundamentally change urban firefighting as we know it today. It talked about prevention, training and outreach. It had uh, uh, materials and design issues for homes and buildings. And it had a significant focus on research and education. So by 1974, we create the Federal Fire Prevention and Control Act. And we have made some remarkable strides and gains in urban firefighting. So if you compare the 1970s to about today, uh, we can show you that the number of deaths that occur every year is down by nearly 70%. The property lost has decreased, and these are adjusted numbers, has decreased by nearly half. Structure fires in the United States have gone down by nearly 63%. And the number of injuries that we have from structure and urban fires have decreased by 75%. Remarkable gains. Now, to put that a little bit more into perspective, though, at that same time period, our population in the United States increased by over 100 million people. Wow, I mean, that much growth at that time, and still we're able to make those dramatic changes in our country. Phenomenal. Now, let me show you what happened with wildland firefighting in that same time period. 
the fire season from the 1970s to today has increased by nearly 50%. If you look at just our federal lands and the Forest Service, and this mirrors the rest of the United States and California, the number of fires over 1,000 acres has increased by 100%. The number of fires over 10,000 acres has increased by 250%. And the total number of acres burned in the United States has gone from roughly 3 million acres per year in the 1970s to well over 8 million acres today. That's stunning. The worst year on record was 2015, where we burned over 12.5 million acres in the United States. So, yeah, it is broken. And we need to figure out how to change this industry to provide them with new tools to fight wildland fires. To put this in perspective, 8 million acres is the size of the state of Massachusetts that we lose every year in the United States. And a bit of a geography lesson, anybody know it's five states the size of, oh, come on folks, Delaware. <laughs> All right. But it's also, to put it into a local perspective, losing about 420 cities the size of Temecula. Right? That's what we're losing every year. 95% of those fires nationwide are human-caused events. They're not natural events. They're not lightning strikes. They're human-caused. One in six damages infrastructure, transportation, and one in 10 results in the loss of a home, with roughly 3,000 homes every year being lost to a wildland fire. It's not just a West Coast issue. It's not just a California issue. Nationwide, we have over 277,000 square miles of what's called the wildland urban interface, or that really high-risk zone where our urban areas meet the wildland, right? 45 million homes in the United States are built in that interface, in this high-risk area. Connecticut is number one with the most amount of wildland urban interface, but California, we win. We have more homes in that high-risk area than any other state with roughly 5.1 million homes and growing. That number is going to increase because here's another surprising number. California has only built about 15% of the land available in that wildland urban interface, 15%. So we have to wrap our hands around this. We have to help the fire industry deal with this situation. We have to bring them out of a century-old practice. As I've worked with them over the years, a lot of folks refer to them as an industry of deep tradition, unencumbered by progress, <laughs> right? So. The, the concept of a wildland fire, that stuff that just burns vegetation or heavy timber, chaparral or grasslands, has vastly changed. We don't see that as much anymore. We see these fires moving into our backyards. And when this has happened, we see fires that bring in products that burn that we've never had historically. And we try and wonder, as those firefighters are working out there for weeks at a time, days at a time, 24-hour shifts, what are they being exposed to? What's happening to them while they are doing their job to protect your community and your lives? Now, structure firefighters, after the America's burning, made some vast changes in protective gear and protocols. They wear the SCBAs, the, the devices that help uh, uh, give them fresh air and, and breathing. Wildland firefighters have the equivalent to a bandana. Why? Because the breathing apparatus only gives you about 20 to 30 minutes of air at best. It's heavy, it's large, and it's cumbersome to use in an environment where you're working for 8, 12, or 24 hours hiking. Right? We don't have that kind of protection. And so we started asking some basic questions like, when you're 200 feet away from a home and a vehicle that's burning and you're fighting wildland fire, what are you breathing? And stunning to find out that we didn't know the answer to that. After 100 years of, of, of wildland firefighting, we haven't figured that out, really? If you go to the memorial in Sacramento, Firefighters Memorial, it's just outside the Capitol. Um, over the last several years, roughly 90% of the names that have been added to that wall are the result 
of cancer fatalities, not fatalities on the fire line. Right? So something is happening. Something has changed in this industry. How do we deal with it? So in 2014, I was invited by Cal Fire Local and others to host a workshop. And this workshop was focused on how do we address this situation? How do we create that Blue Ribbon Commission that was done in 1973 by the Nixon administration? So we brought people from all over the country to Sacramento to ask the hard questions. How do we move this thing forward? And we had several days of great conversation and dialogue. One of the things that came out of it is we just need to change the nomenclature, right? We need to stop calling it a wildfire and start calling it a wildland urban interface fire, right? Let's be real with the situation that we're confronted with every day because people's perceptions will change once you start using those terms more. Let's stop calling it a fire season. A fire season suggests that there's a discrete period of the year in which we have fires. Well, that's not the case. In fact, half of the largest fires in California's recent history have happened in the winter time. So we need to change the way we think about this. But most importantly, the biggest recommendations that came out of that symposium were much like in 1973, research and education, right? So at this point, I've hit, uh, sadly, the midpoint in my working career, I think, right? And I had to make a decision. You know, I spent years going to these scientific conferences, giving presentations in front of other scientists, and everybody sort of patting themselves on the back and each other saying, oh yeah, I agree with you, and that's great information. And, and a lot of this stuff just sat on a shelf and collected dust, right? And so I made a decision. I stopped doing that, and I started working hand in hand with the wildland firefighters and asking them, what's important to you? What are the questions that need to be asked? I wasn't presenting my results just at uh, national science meetings anymore. I was presenting them at firefighter conferences, workshops, specific to those firefighters. And what I found was the reports and the research and the information we had was relevant, and it didn't sit on a shelf and collect dust. It made its way into the hands of our policymakers, our legislature, our decision makers, at the local government, state government, and even, even federal government level. We were affecting some kind of change. But it wasn't enough, right? It wasn't nearly enough. We know that firefighters and wildland uh, urban interface are regularly exposed to hazardous and toxic substances from carbon monoxide to volatile organic compounds and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, known cancer-causing substances. We don't know how bad it is, and we don't know what the long-term effects are because there has never been a long-term study on any of this. We did a study and tracked about 100 firefighters over a period of a couple of years, and we found out that they exceeded all sorts of recommended heart temperature and, and exposure rates. They were experiencing some of the harshest conditions imaginable on this planet. We had firefighters with peak heart rates sustained at above 200 beats a minute and even 220 beats a minute. Now, if you know anything about your heart rate, it says the American Heart Association recommends 220 minus your age as a maximum heart rate. And a working heart rate maximum is 85% of that number. Right? So if you want to do the math, mine is about 157, then you can figure out how old I am. So, two-thirds of our firefighters were working at or near dehydration. Many of them carried core body temperatures above 102 degrees for hours and hours at a time, and a significant number of them were edging close to 104 degrees. We were able to work with some of the foremost national laboratories, National Institute of Standards and Technology, the U.S. Forest Service, and others, and we brought the materials, we brought these things into the laboratory and said, what are we exposing these folks to? What are these conditions like? And then we did larger sort of burns where we tried to simulate, you know, the wildland urban interface. But I'll tell you something I learned along this journey as well. It's not like being there. You know, researchers and scientists are really good at being in the laboratory a lot of times, looking at things from a different perspective. I had the opportunity to work side by side, shoulder to shoulder with wildland firefighters, and it completely changed my perspective on wildland firefighting. Being there, seeing that, feeling it, breathing it, right? 
It completely changed my perspective on what these folks are putting themselves through on a regular basis. Scientists often aren't able to see the forest for the trees. And so we need to work hand in hand with those firefighters. And so we created a program at Cal State University at San Marcos. That's a Bachelor of Science in Wildland Fire and the Urban Interface, first of its kind in the country. And there's something unique to this program. We actually worked hand in hand with firefighters and fire agencies across the United States, and we told them, look, I'm not hiring folks, you are. So what is it that you need in this curriculum? What do you need to have these folks learn? And of course, a big push was the research side, the scientists, we want good scientists. And we realized that if you want to effectuate good change, yeah, the scientists, the researchers, we can sit back and we can do our job. But man, if you provide them with the tools themselves to do it, that's the biggest opportunity for change. And so hopefully, if all the permissions are through the university system and everything else, next year we'll be launching this program. And we hope that it's just one more tool that we can give the wildland and urban interface firefighters to do their job today. Thank you.